evening and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jay Mans, speaking uh, without my camera today, um, and I'm the executive director of the forum. I will not waste much of your time, but I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you very, very, very much to our STEAM participants, who I hope will introduce themselves soon. The talk will be hosted by Imad mostly, and hopefully after an hour or so, we'll actually get to questions and answers for the panel. Uh, so that's just the general format. And Marcus will be taking care of uh, the technical aspects of the hosting as he's been doing so far. So without wasting any more time, I'll go straight to Imad. And I hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot, Jay. Hello, everyone, and good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, so I'm Imad Adin Badi. I'm a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. And today I'll actually be moderating this discussion rather than speaking. Uh, I focus primarily on Libya's politics and security. Uh, and today we have a great lineup of actually four speakers that will be speaking to the contemporary situation in Libya. Uh, and hopefully we'll be open to discussing a broad area of issues beyond what we kind of pre-agreed to speak about. Um, the event is going to be focused about how we got here there's a part that kind of analyzes uh, how we got here today, but also afterwards kind of a diagnosis of the contemporary situation from different perspectives. Uh, so we'll be focusing on the geopolitical landscape of the conflict. So the escalation that pits somewhat Turkey against Russia, the UAE and potentially Egypt, uh, but also the ideological divides amongst these states, their reasons for intervening and other important emphasized a uh, aspects that are somewhat miss missing in action sometimes, like uh, the domestic politics. We forget that Libyans have agency to a certain extent in, in, in this, and the general state of rule of law in the country and human rights abuses. So I'll actually challenge my speakers to cover these in 15 minutes or less. Uh, without further ado, I'll actually introduce them. Uh, so amongst the four speakers that we have today, uh, we have Peter Millet, who's a former British diplomat who served as British ambassador to Libya from June 15 to January 2018. He oversaw the return of the British embassy to Libya, uh, and he also supported the, the UN's brokering of a political dialogue uh, in uh, late uh, 2015. We have Jalal Harshawi, who is a research fellow in the Conflict Research Unit of the Kligendale Institute. He focuses also on Libya, uh, the security landscape, and the political economy. We have Hanan Salah, who's a senior Libya researcher in the Middle East and North Africa Division of Human Rights Watch. And uh, last but not least, the other Libyan in the call, uh, Tarek Majrisi, who is a political analyst and also a policy fellow with the North Africa and Middle East program at the European Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, before I actually direct my questions to uh, my panelists, I'll actually focus on, I'll actually tell you maybe to send me your questions privately to me uh, by messages if you have any, and then I'll pose them uh, to the panelists afterwards, if that's okay with you. Uh, so I, I'll actually be receiving these as we go along and after uh, the panelists somewhat cover everything that they're supposed to cover, uh, we'll go into the Q&A. Um, I'll challenge, as I said, my speakers to cover all the areas that we're supposed to cover in 15 minutes or less. Uh, and I won't take much more of your time. Now this is the boring part. Uh, I'll, the first speaker will be Tariq. Uh, Tariq, since you're the kind of only other Libyan here, I'll challenge you to speak about how we got here uh, 10 years on after the revolution and maybe cover the geopolitical aspects of different backers uh, of the two sides today. So on the one hand, Turkey, and perhaps in, more in the background, Qatar. And on the other hand, uh, the UAE, Russia, and potentially uh, Egypt as well. So without further ado, I'll leave, I'll leave you to speak now. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Um, that's a big task for 4 p.m. in the afternoon to condense all of this in 15 minutes. But uh, I'll stop wasting time and, and, and try to get to it then. Um, you know, to... Libya's case is kind of 
one that often scares people off because it's it seemed to be too too complex um and god knows probably everybody on this panel has has seen people's eyes glaze over as they try to explain um some of the dynamics that are going on so i'll try to stick to the kind of 30,000 foot view um of what happened over the last uh, 10 years um and then hopefully you know we can dig deeper into any particular point uh in the q a um but if i can really simplify and i hope uh I don't do the situation a disservice by by oversimplifying. I think the the dominant dynamic of Libya over the last ten years is one of of revolution and counter revolution, as it were. Um, so you know, obviously, in in two thousand and eleven, uh, there was this great uprising, um, which you know I think can all could almost be called more of a, an intifada than a revolution um, because it was, a, it was an uprising and a shaking off as, of Gaddafi as a leader um, without actually taking that further step to change the system of governance in place in the country. Instead, we ended up in a situation whereby various camps uh, within Libya, uh, either claiming to represent a particular geography uh, you know, a city, a tribe, uh, or whatnot, um, or claiming to represent a, a political ideology, uh, fought for absolute control over over the levers of of Gaddafi's Libya, um, and I think that that speaks something to to the power that Gaddafi had over the Libyan pop, pop, population. You know, it's it's all well and good for a dictator to be able to to control the people by fear, but I think the real Na the real nature of control comes from the idea that you can shape uh, your population's entire lexicon on a particular subject. And still, you know, 10 years after the fall of Gaddafi, um, many Libyans struggle to perceive of a political system that is not a replica of, of the Jamahariya or the state of the masses that Gaddafi created, uh, whereby you have a, a, a hierarchy um, of particular tribes or communities um, and it's the, you know, effectively governance um, of the few over the many to the victor go the spoils, haves and have nots, this kind of divide and conquer rule. Um, and it's one that, that opens Libya up to, to foreign exploitation um, because you always have a series of groups who are looking for, for absolute control um, rather than to engage in the, in the politics of consensus. Um, and for all the many different political personalities that Libya has had over the last 10 years, they never had a, a Khanushi figure, uh, if I could learn from, um, from the head of Tunisia's Ennahda party, who famously tried to engage in, in consensus politics around the constitution in order to stop the kind of tribalism that was growing at the time. Um, and so it's a political environment that that has always kind of been open for less principled foreign states to to swoop in and, and take advantage of. Um, and this is exactly what happened in in Libya's case. Um, so you know, in the early years after the revolution, uh, the political scene was was very loosely divided between two camps. Um, and although many always love to use the Islamist framing of, you know, you have technocrats or you have uh, secularists and Islamists, I think it's extremely dangerous to talk of secularists in Libya. Um, it's quite a conservative and traditionalist society as is. Uh, and even the Islamist framing, I think, is not particularly apt. Um, you had, by and large, uh, um, a very wide variety of different groups who were unified by their absolute resistance or absolute refusal to, to engage in any remnant of the Gaddafi regime and, uh, and almost, uh, almost as if they were driven by insecurity and urged to take absolute control of the state. I mean, of course, for their own personal economic and political gains or the political gains of their of their community, but also really to ensure their own protection. At least that was their narrative that was passed down. And then on the other side, you had really those who, who self-perceived as, as technocrats, um, many of whom had worked with, with Gaddafi's son, Saif al-Islam, um, and to try to reform the country uh, in earlier days um, and had stayed close to kind of 
the the places where they had uh, where they had retreated to as their plans didn't come to fruition, um, such as Egypt and the UAE. Um, and so this split essentially uh, toxified Libyan politics and it froze Libyan politics. And in this very, very fragile and uh, nascent period in, in Libya's revolutionary history, it meant that there was no effective political direction or, or, or head on the Libyan body politic. Um, and this is, I suppose, where the, the, um, the urge of, of foreign interests really came in, into direct play because they took advantage of the, of the squalid the nature of, of Libyan politics to start to co-opt Libyan groups to a greater and greater degree. Um, and I think perhaps the most effective way of framing what happened since that early period until today is to talk of an internationalized counter-revolution. I mean, there was a great paper, I think it came out from, from Stanford a few months ago that was looking at, um, at um, bot networks and kind of uh, messaging around Libyan personalities. And they trace kind of the first, um, these first kind of uh, PR, if you would, around uh, Khalifa Haftar, the figure has kind of grown to, to dominate the last six years of Libyan politics to as early as, as 2013. Uh, when that first Libyan parliament started to collapse. Um, and Khalifa Haftar has, has headed kind of a, a military authority um, or a, a military head on kind of a counter-revolutionary push um, to restore um, authoritarian rule to, to Libya um, since late 2013 onwards. Um, and I think it's, it's very telling that you know, Haftar was a character who kind of bounced around the Libyan scene for a long time, tried to make many different causes his own, always as a leader, um, but ultimately failed. Um, and it's, it's only when he, he entered Libya or re-entered Libya at this very fragile time, um, passing through Cairo and with the support, um, you know, of the Egyptians and of the Emiratis, uh, that he really found a, a vehicle to make his position stick. Um, and, you know, if you start to unpack this, um, you have kind of a, a regional conflict at play, um, which was heightened or made more acute by the Arab Spring. Um, you had the notion of whether you would let revolutionary change sweep the Arab world. Um, and in, in the case of, of Qatar, um, they were a state that not only tried to perhaps encourage it, but always make sure that, that, that they were well placed to, to benefit from it. And then you had the kind of Emirati position opposed to them, which was to say that, that change is scary, change is dangerous, um, change is something that might come to us in the future if it's successful elsewhere. Um, and so they sought to, to push for evolution over revolution to be kind, um, to really try to restore the traditional order of what I say traditional, um, the modern order of, of military autocrats um, or presidents for life over the Arab world, um, as we could see in what happened in, in Egypt um, around the, the rise of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, and the very similar narrative and framing that went into the Haftar project. Um, but unfortunately for the Emiratis, you know, Haftar is not Sisi and this Libyan Arab armed forces that he tried to put together was not the Egyptian military. Um, and so it, it was really a years long process um, of kind of a taking um, other diplomats engaged in Libya for, for a long ride, um, trying to always paint Haftar as kind of a representative of grievances of different Libyan groups, um, talking about how he has to be accommodated as they slowly grow his profile. Um, and then it came really the all or nothing moment, um, perhaps the the moment that pushed Libya back onto the news uh, for the first time since 2011, uh, which was when Haftar launched his attack on the capital of Tripoli. Uh, and this was after kind of four years of a very destructive campaign going through Eastern Libya and trying to grow this, this base and this political entity that he was heading up both within Libya uh, and externally. Um, and, you know, essentially this was a, an all or nothing gambit to try to, to take control of the country and create a fait accompli. Um, and it was kind of the culmination of this, of this Emirati Egyptian way of looking at Libya 
and this ideological push to kind of try to take control. Um, but really the finality of the situation that they created or the, the kind of existential threat that a, a Haftar or an Emirati dominated Libya might pose um, only really provoked um, Turkey into their own intervention. Um, now to give some, some background on, on the Turkish position, you know, Turkey has long been interested in Libya. Um, it's got economic, it's got political uh, interests that have, have, you know, long kept it connected to, to revolutionary Libya. Um, but it never really felt the need to, to intervene in, in such a manner as we saw in, in late 2019, early 2020, until the kind of risk that, um, that the Emirates might create this fait accompli and effectively lock Turkey out of, of um, access to more Southern Africa through, uh, li through Libya, but also elsewhere in the Maghreb. Um, and it was this kind of geopolitical imperative allied to the idea that, you know, Turkey understands full well that it's engaged in kind of a regional rivalry with the UAE uh, for, for influence in, in the region um, that pushed it to kind of make a stand. Um, and this is where we saw the, um, the very formal uh, overt intervention of Turkey. Um, and to kind of tie to what might come next, but I'll try to not go down this tangent too much, uh, there was also the element of the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, which is not directly linked to Libya, but as the Turks so savvily kind of leveraged the two together, I think I should um, at least try to speak of it, whereby Turkey feels itself being constrained and being uh, relegated into obscurity from their, you know, um, their geopolitical heartland, as it were, their traditional base of being the dominant power um, in the Eastern Mediterranean by virtue of being the guardians of the Bosphorus. Um, and so they wanted to use Libya and to kind of leverage the desperation of Libya's government um, in order to, to redraw uh, maritime boundaries, in order to... Um, Sorry, um, in order to um, make a new, um, <laughs> sorry, I, uh, I uh, lost my train of thought, in order to make a new... Um, make facts on the water. Reality. Yeah, exactly. Facts on the water, I think, is a good way of putting it. Um, and so we arrive at a situation where we are today, um, where... Um, where Turkey has essentially undone what the UAE tried to create over a period of six years in the space of six months. Um, and you see the kind of Haftar project has completely collapsed. But unfortunately, um, we were unable to kind of, to build a new resolution or a new political reality from that, uh, from that base. And so instead, um, you know, we kind of still have a stalemate, but instead of around Tripoli, it's now around the city of Sirt um, in central Libya. Um, and this kind of Haftar project that, that died and collapsed was recreated around a new political entity, uh, which is the, the head of the parliament, Aguila Saleh. Um, but the difference between this and the Haftar project is that this is a political entity rather than a military entity, and it needs protection. Um, and this is where kind of Russia's growing prominence um, due to its, its ability to create military facts on the ground and its military competence um, and the kind of urge to, to drag Egypt into intervening into Libya formally um, have come about. Um, so we have a very new type of conflict forming whereby you have these Western Libyan factions supported and armed by, by Turkey um, and whilst before you had almost a mirror image of this in the East, now you actually seem to have largely a mercenary force um, and, uh, you know, a, a foreign imposed uh, project squaring up against them. But the imperative of trying to stop this conflict before it develops into, into something that, um, that could be catastrophic and that could open up all kinds of unexpected consequences uh, is what's driving current diplomacy. I think I managed that in under 15 minutes, but I'll, I'll yeah, hand it back to you, Ahmed. No, you, you did. We, are, we seem to have a bit of this situation in the chat as well. Uh, so sorry about that. It's clearly one of the things that also affects us in the 
digital space, let's say, of the Libya conflict, this this type of disinformation campaign. But um, all right, I'll move on to actually Peter, and uh, maybe you can kind of dovetail with what Tarek was mentioning about the Eastern Mediterranean, but also speak to other dynamics. So we have some countries or perhaps blocks that were once maybe looked at as potential brokers of peace in Libya. And I'm here particularly referring to the EU, uh, to perhaps also the US and to the UK to a certain extent. And they gradually have appeared to be perhaps since right after the revolution, but now definitely seem to be missing in action within uh, within the framework of what's going on. Uh, so how would you perhaps, first of all, describe their policies and what lens do they use to view uh, Libya? And maybe to challenge you a little bit, uh, why do you think there's a certain reticence to exert the same type of political capital that we've seen in 2016 to broker uh, a political dialogue, to broker the Sherat Agreement? So I hope you can accommodate that question in your remarks. Okay, Ahmed, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm struck by the fact that all those countries, the Europe, Europeans, the UK and the US, have more or less lost their voice, lost their unified voice. Uh, and certainly looking back uh, at my time, and I look back at 2015, uh, all those countries work together very closely in supporting the UN effort to lead to the agreement that was signed in December 2015 in Sekhenat. Uh, and uh, we worked very closely together, the EU ambassador, myself, the French ambassador and the Spanish ambassador were the first ambassadors to go back to Tripoli in April 2016 to show our support for the Presidency Council, the GNA, and the Libya political agreement. But I think there was a strong element of wishful thinking behind what we were doing, um, because it became apparent that the French, in particular, were backing both sides. They had forces uh, working with Heftar. I think their main motivation at that time was counterterrorism, uh, it's supporting uh, Heftar fighting Ansar Sharia and others in Benghazi, but also because of the French uh, very close relationship with the Emiratis and, and the Egyptians. Uh, so the French played that role in supporting Heftar in Benghazi and then in Derna. I think they also supported him uh, in taking control of the oil crescent and the south of Libya because of their strategic interests in the, in the Sahel. And at the same time, President Macron was inviting uh, Siraj and Heftar to Paris in 2017, organizing the big summit, summit at uh, La Salle Saint Claude uh, in 2018, uh, grandstanding on the stage a little bit. Uh, but I think the French uh, approach has has unraveled. I think in the last uh, few few weeks and months, in particular, as Heftar's power grab on Tripoli has embarrassed them, embarrassed them internationally and embarrass them in Libya as well. Uh, but all during that period, in the last 12 to 15 months, the French have not only been supporting Heftar military, but in particular, they've supported him politically, uh, both at the Security Council uh, and within the EU, which has meant that both those bodies, or neither of those bodies, has been able to make any strong statements. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the French approach has undermined the ability of the international community to condemn the attack on Tripoli, to condemn the human rights abuses which have become apparent. Uh, France has also uh, clearly been using the um, maritime agreement between Turkey and the GNA um, to bind in Greece and Cyprus to show their interests in the Eastern Mediterranean and Macron's uh, last week calling for sanctions against Turkey has also revealed that that's something within the EU which is dividing uh, the European Union. Um, moving on to a couple of other EU countries, clearly Italy, partly for colonial uh, legacy, partly for energy related reasons, partly because of, um, particularly under the uh, Salvini when he was Minister of Interior, their fear of the, the migrant flows coming towards Italy. And Italy has always wanted to be number one as far as European countries working on, on Libya. After the uh, Macron-hosted summits, uh, the Italians had felt that they had to host their own summit in Palermo in 2018, 
there was a rivalry, which is um, very apparent between France, between Paris and Rome as to who is the lead player. So I think when uh, Hassan Salome was looking for a, a strong and influential neutral country, he therefore turned to Berlin. He went to see Chancellor Merkel and asked her to uh, try and bring the international community together, um, which she succeeded in doing in January the 19th uh, of, of uh, 2020, uh, to try and unite not just the European, but all the international players. It was quite, quite a cast list and they managed to get together, uh, including uh, Erdogan and Sisi around the same table. Um, and they signed up to a very uh, um, uh, loose uh, commitment to a ceasefire, to international support for the UN. It is quite apparent at that time that many of the countries who are making political commitments were not going to stop doing behind the scenes and under the table what they've been doing already. That included a French, a particular French support for the Emiratis, and particularly what the Turks would continue to do uh, with the GNA. Um, so I think the Germans have tried hard and will continue to try hard. But I think they will struggle to achieve unity within the European Union. Um, the, I should mention Operation Irini, I think others will probably come onto it, uh, which was an EU initiative to monitor the arms embargo. Uh, but even there, it is really only monitoring a fee cargo and therefore Turkish car cargoes and not Emirati cargoes which are coming by by air. So it is seen, I think, as a, as a biased approach by the European Union, and that, therefore not the sort of even-handed, uh, internationally motivated initiative that uh, was the in original intention. Just to mention uh, the other two countries you mentioned, the UK, I think because it's been uh, preoccupied by Brexit, uh, because of COVID-19, has been missing in action. Uh, I know that uh, my successor, the ambassador in Tunis, is very active, but, but the visibility uh, is not there. Uh, and I don't think, uh, well, I, I, I hear from a lot of Libyans who say, where is the UK? We'd like to see them more actively engaged. Um, and I would like to see them act more actively engaged. I think the UK is a country which has, uh, has relations with all the countries, the external players, but also has good relations with the different parts of, uh, of Libya, could play a more influential role. And then finally, with the United States, uh, well, uh, Trump at one point when he, was, uh, when he was hosting the Italian Prime Minister Gentiloni, he basically said, we're not interested uh, in, in Libya. He was then persuaded, I think, by the Egyptians and the Emiratis to make an ill-advised call on, on Heftar, which I think confused an awful lot of people. I think the American approach has basically been driven by counter-terrorism, uh, by AFRICOM's activity, for example, in CERT in 2016 to try and counter Daesh uh, in Libya, uh, in which the GNA and Fayez Siraj was one of their main allies. So the Trump call to Heftar really uh, put the cat among the pigeons and uh, confused a lot of players. But I think of none of those countries really are playing a most significant role. And as uh, Emad Yu and Tarek uh, have commented elsewhere, that does leave the field to the Russians and the Turks to try and stitch up a deal between themselves, uh, knowing that the, the other players can't play a, a significant role because there's no unified approach between them. And equally, the Security Council is undermined by divisions, particularly when, between the permanent five. So a lack of a strong voice, uh, a certain amount of wishful thinking, some activity behind the scenes, um, but very little um, uh, very little mention of getting behind a, a, any sort of UN initiative, which is what Berlin was supposed to be uh, all about. I'll leave it there and be very happy to answer questions or, or comments uh, that come up. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Peter. I'll actually, so I'll mention one thing, maybe something to ponder that is linked to a question I received uh, earlier. So on European and kind of American inputs into SSR. Well, one of the things that's crystallized, or to a certain extent, at a certain period in time, crystallized in terms of American policy is this 3M approach, uh, the militias, money, and Muslim Brotherhood approach that was deployed to Libya. So how do you view that from a maybe security perspective, what, what the impact of that will be uh, moving forward? So just something to think about uh, for, to discuss later on. Uh, a little update on the kind of logistical 
question sending bit. Uh, so now you can actually send your questions to the host, the, mean, the MENAF committee, that's the, that's the account, and they'll be forwarded to me and I'll be able to kind of ask, ask them to the speakers afterwards. So apologies for that, for that logistical mishap. Um, I'll move on now to Jalal. Uh, Jalal, I'll, it's difficult to compartmentalize, obviously, the Libyan kind of landscape from the geopolitical one. Uh, so I think you'll obviously speak to that to a certain extent, but uh, I'll challenge you a little bit to maybe speak to Libyan's agency uh, in the conflict. Uh, so Libyan dynamics, so to speak, domestically, uh, how you view them right now, how they've evolved, and perhaps also a specific reference to what's going on uh, in Libya's Fazan, uh, a very, very geographically wide area uh, that is by and large to a certain extent less populated but still vital from a political economic point of view and that will probably be the theater of some maneuvering by the diverse domestic players in the upcoming period so uh, yeah uh, I think he's yeah there you go yeah 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 got it so thank you, Ahmed, and thank you uh, to the Cambridge Middle East and North Africa Forum. I'm uh, deeply honored by this invitation. Uh, yeah, I would. I wanted to um, uh, speak uh, on purpose on on uh, on dynamics that are a little bit eclipsed and, and overshadowed these days with the, all the geopolitical headlines. Uh, regarding Libyan dynamics, uh, very generally speaking, uh, I would like to just say one thing: is that for the last 18 months. Uh, we have been living through an aberration in the sense that there has been a pretty gross um, internationalized uh, attempt to, uh, to take Tripoli uh, using forces from outside as much as inside. And uh, because of this uh, abnormally simplistic configuration, uh, everybody, and not just the diplomats and uh, the observers and the media, but also the researchers, everybody got used to a, a very binary setup and we kind of lost track of including things that we know, which is the fact that there's no overarching theme in, uh, in the Libyan fragmentation. It's just fragmentation that happens to exist and there's no greater purpose. Uh, and, and because of the last uh, 18 months, we, uh, we tend to forget uh, obviously the ultra local uh, nature of, of really the root causes of some of the uh, the incidents and clashes and um, <clears throat> and, in, and so I would basically just say that we have a lot of catching up to do a lot of homework uh, in terms of going back to this uh, not only the fact that it's important but we also have to remember that the the, the latest adventure the bis this big attempt which was uh, uh, you know uh, basically ended up being a, a big failure to take uh, Tripoli, the, one of the failure, one of the reasons behind the failure is the fact that at the end, uh, it's exactly what I've been trying to say, which is the fact that you cannot, even if you spend billions, even if you intervene, you cannot control the very low, very, very, very local. Um, so the, 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 the case study that I kind of wanted to speak about, because I know that all, everything else is going to be very, very well covered, obviously today, uh, given the, 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 the profile of the, of the speakers, I wanted to speak about the Fazan. And uh, I would, so the Fazan obviously is this uh, big province. It's the, the quote unquote, the third province after Tripolitania, after Cyrenaica. Cyrenaica is this, the, basically the Eastern half uh, from top to bottom. Um, uh, it, it, so the third one, the, the forgotten one uh, very often is, uh, is the Fazan, which is, as you said, Imad, very large. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, three times as vast as uh, the whole of Syria for a population that is less than 500,000 people. Uh, and I wanted to use a, a, as an introduction an anecdote is uh, something that happened right before Christmas in 2018. So we're less than three weeks away or roughly three weeks away from this big decision on the part of Marshal Haftar to finally go uh, in a full blown way into the Fazan and, and claim control over big cities like Sebha. There was an encounter between Prime Minister Siraj, who's the Prime Minister of the internationally recognized government, and Mike Pompeo. It was not supposed to be a, a high, like a visible encounter that just met in Brussels uh, because it, uh, the, the schedules kind of worked out. And Mike Pompeo had effectively three requests for the, for the GNA. He said, you know, 
uh, you have some, uh, you know, uh, overdue payments to some uh, international companies, uh, uh, American companies that you should uh, look into. Uh, we appreciate your uh, collaboration on uh, counterterrorism, but you, I would like to step it up a little bit. We need more information and so on and so forth. And the big request really was to unjam this blockade that had uh, blocked uh, the production out of Sharara. Sharara is probably the single uh, largest uh, oil field and it's located not far away from Obari, which is in, in the Fazan, obviously. And he's, he, the, the request from Pompeo was like, take care of, uh, of Shara. Try it. You have the means, you have the money, you, you're the prime minister, look into it and, and please fix the situation or else. So what I'm saying is that already in December, obviously, you have this idea that the GNA had uh, blown it, that it that really didn't deserve all the, the international recognition and the U.S. support. And it's true that a lot of the U.S. diplomats were really being attracted to this uh, forceful solution that was not, it wasn't publicized as completely violent or barbaric on the part of Haftar. It was just like a more uh, a mask align, more military uh, solution in terms of finally addressing the problems that had been neglected by the GNA. W what I'm trying to say is that that neglect is actually real because um, um, Siraj had visited already Shara, had made promises, didn't deliver. He didn't go back in January and, and really didn't take it very seriously. So the neglect is absolutely real. Um, and uh, the second part of my anecdote is uh, the current picture. The current picture is that you have articles now in the Wall Street Journal talking about the fact that Sharara, the same mega oil field, is effectively uh, militarily controlled partly by Russian mercenaries accompanied by Sudanese mercenaries coming, coming out of uh, Jufra Air Base. The Jufra Air Base was refurbished by the Emiratis in 2019 for the purpose of uh, supporting Haftar in, in Tripoli. So effect, effectively, this, this idea that Haftar was going to be the, the man, the strong man that was going to finally take uh, matters into his own hands didn't really, uh, didn't really correspond to reality. It, wasn't, it was more myth than reality at the end of the day here we are uh, roughly um, 18 months later, uh, and uh, the, 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 the actors controlling this uh, 315,000 barrel a day oil field is, uh, is, uh, is, are, are not even Libyans. And so we're effectively talking about two states that sometimes make it to the headlines, Russia and, and the Emiratis. And, and they were denounced by the national oil company and so on and so forth. So this, this is basically what I wanted to say is this tradition of neglect uh, towards uh, the Fazan. And it's very paradoxical because the Fazan contains most of the freshwater mineral, I'm talking about gold and iron ore and other, other uh, goodies, and obviously the hydrocarbon uh, reserves of the country. So the nation's livelihood is actually heavily predicated upon uh, the Libyan Sahara in general. So if you include the southern part of Cyrenaica. And in spite of that, uh, Libyan's northern elites, because the elites tend to come from, from the coast, obviously, historically, regard the Fazan as uh, secondary or uh, peripheral, if you will. And periodically, however, um, uh, this uh, sparsely populated expanse reclaims its strategic importance in Libya's national affairs. So you have these key moments that happen from time to time throughout history. Uh, where the Fazan, of course, matters. And you have actors of the Libyan coast that rush and scramble in order to pursue ad hoc arrangements with uh, the local elites. And, uh, and, and those uh, Saharan or, or you know, the, the, the elites of the Fazan, they tend to usually, by and large, side with the faction that at that particular moment in time seems more likely to guarantee financial support and uh, political influence on a big enough basis, like the most sustainable actor, if you will. Um, and, and what's also true periodically is the fact that the elite class of Libya, and this time I mean actually including the elites that are native to the South, because they're not angels either, uh, those elites seldom hold their promises when it comes to improving the lot and the actual conditions of the local population in the South in general. So um, their attention, what happens is that their attention inevitably refocuses back onto uh, the literal, where most of the key institutions, the political jockeying and the levers of power uh, are, are playing out. Um, so 
it's basically a chronic reluctance to uh, share public wealth with the actual origin of that public wealth. And what you have is an, an indifference that, that keeps prevailing, not all the time, but it's like a pattern that keeps coming back uh, when it comes to really improving the socioeconomic uh, development of, of the South. Right now, uh, you know, I, I try to speak with people in the Fuzan uh, almost on a daily basis, and they, they're very fatigued, very depressed. They speak about regular kidnappings, uh, extrajudicial violence, you know, uh, scores being settled. And of course, uh, they speak a lot about the healthcare system's uh, vulnerability. And they were actually talking about this even before COVID. And now, uh, of course, the main cluster of COVID is, is in the Fuzan. So uh, basically what you have is effectively is not only do you fail to ameliorate the security and governance difficulties associated with the Fuzan, but because those promises are not held, you add a new layer of bitterness. And it, so you effectively have this cycle that, that keeps uh, going forward. Uh, I would like to say that, so Muammar Gaddafi was no different. For example, what, what he did with the taboo, inviting them from Chad and promising all kinds of stuff in the late 80s and only to rescind all those promises uh, a few years later in the 90s. That is typically the lack of commitment that I was uh, trying to uh, um, allude to. That being said, in the 90s, for all kinds of reasons, Gaddafi actually, who actually spent a big part of his teenage years in the, in the Fuzan, uh, actually paid a lot of attention because he refocused in Africa in general. And so he uh, focused on the Fuzan in a rather genuine fashion. Uh, there was a lot of the money that he dedicated to Fuzan that of course, uh, you know, went up in smoke because of local corruption and so on and so forth, but, but conditions actually improved. Uh, and so the last decade of uh, the Gaddafi reign actually was uh, a rare moment of, of, of improvement. And that, that explains why uh, the actors in the Fuzan ten tended to be rather anti-revolution uh, in 2011. So I would like to just finish by, by giving a rough picture of whoever uh, is interested in this, in this fascinating uh, region. I would tend to say that if you, could just, you could start in a very simplistic way by imagining three or four very large categories of communities. I would begin with uh, the Tuareg. Uh, the Tuareg, uh, of course, are not Arabs, they are Berbers, and, um, and they tend to be located uh, in, in the area between Obari and, and Hat. Uh, they, uh, they have a tradition of, uh, I mean, the, la the, the last several decades, they were quite uh, loyal to Muammar Gaddafi, although he did instrumental instrumentalize them. Um, uh, so that explains why in 2011, they broke away from him only in, in, in July. So they, they remain by and large, uh, of course, you cannot put them all in the same category, but they remain by and large uh, loyal to Gaddafi. So I would describe them as more or less Gaddafists uh, today. Uh, and in terms of day-to-day -day conflicts, I would, I would say they're uh, rather agnostic. They are typically are going to, to look at each actor's ability to win on a nationwide basis, what kind of foreign support, what kind of financial wherewithal, uh, how serious are they before, uh, before switching sides. And if, if the, 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 the criteria are met, they will actually switch sides. Um, and then you have, of course, the, what I would say the, in the northeast of the, uh, of the Fazan, you have the, uh, the prestigious Arab tribes, uh, as opposed to the um, Arabized uh, Africans that are tribeless, the Fazazna. And, and those tribes were actually quite important in terms of, of supporting Gaddafi in, in, uh, in, in those years. And, and those, th those are, um, I would say, rather more or less roughly the same category from an Arab perspective, the Gaddafi, uh, the uh, the uh, the Magaha, but but I would I would tend to highlight the peculiar status of the Aulad Suleiman, who are very important when it comes to controlling Sabha, the main the main city, city of a hundred thousand. Those were a little bit ambivalent. They were all oh, they always stood out historically. You can go back a couple of of, of centuries, and and in in two thousand eleven they were quite ambivalent as well, and they kind of you know tried to embrace the revolutionary narrative, but a little bit late, and 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 they have been you know showing a bit of problems with you know with their uh, adversity towards uh, the Qadatfa and the Tobu. And they have been very difficult for, for Haftar to, uh, to convince and seduce and, and mobilize. And God knows whether he tried over the last uh, two, three years. And the third group, of course, are the Tubu, who, who were abnormally powerful and, and, and wealthy right after 2011. And they've kind of lost their, their influence. And they even geographically, they tend to be more virulent 
in, in the southern part of, of the Fazan. So uh, that complexity explains why Haftar really, before, like he started looking in the Fazan seriously in late 2016 uh, and in terms of his comeback. And that comeback effectively happened only when we had, when he had the, the financial wherewithal, the proper alliances and the military equipment to actually finally go in, which happened in, in mid-January 2019. And, uh, and he did go, he did send uh, brigades from, uh, from Benghazi and, and the, the reception in, in, uh, in, in sub was not too violent. There, uh, it, there was a level of accept even on the part of the taboo initially. Uh, and, and of course, the, the only truly violent incidents were in late February 2019 when, when it came to Morzok, this area where, where the, 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 the taboo tend to be mixed with the Fazaz now that I was referring to earlier. But, but uh, you know, from a, a Sabha perspective, the important cities, uh, a lot of the people that I speak with, regardless of their political sympathies, uh, they tend to remember this uh, moment where you actually had human resources, military resources, financial resources being injected in a serious way from that side. It kind of clicked, it kind of worked, uh, but it didn't last. It didn't last because the, the next priority, starting in early uh, March in 2019, you already had like a departure of, uh, of the LNA back into, in, into uh, Tripoli. So again, I, I'd like to kind of peddle my theme, which is the uh, inability to truly commit in a, in a genuine, serious, serious fashion. Today, you have a lot of that, uh, I would say, cynicism, you know, the act of being jaded and really looking at who is going to win on a national basis or on a big enough basis to actually make a difference in terms of financial and economic and social, uh, social commitment to the region. What those actors in, in the Fazan uh, know since uh, late May and early June of this year is that for sure, Adil Ane is never going to win Tripoli in all likelihood. Uh, and that explains why you have a tendency to use non-Libyan actors to really, uh, you know, add to the security and, and, the, and the guarantee of, of, of keeping control and the DLNA of those uh, oil assets that I was referring to. Otherwise, there would still be a big uh, probability of, of a switch of the local actors. That being said, I would like to say that the Arab brigades that, uh, that Haftar was able to kind of uh, uh, enroll over the last two, three years, they have been relatively loyal, except for the bulk of the Aulad Suleiman. They have been quite mobile gung-ho, relatively committed, sometimes to some, uh, to, in some regards, more committed than some of the Benghazi brigades, paradoxically. So uh, you have now effectively the ingredients for a war potentially this year uh, when it comes to, um, to seeing maybe a potential comeback on the part of, of the GNA in general into, uh, into the Fazan. They had, uh, Misrata had left in, in the spring of 2017 after 40 months of presence there. Uh, so, you know, you could imagine that all with all these combinations and uh, you, you, you will definitely converge towards a situation where uh, problems will tend to be resolved militarily uh, without forgetting the, the, the foreign dimension that I was referring to earlier. Uh, I would like to finish by saying that uh, Turkey, uh, obviously, since the, 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 since, they were, since the GNA was able to crush uh, Haftar by force in, in late May, early June of this year in the Tripoli area, uh, they, they didn't know, I mean, they, they focused really on CERT because right after CERT you have the old croissant and that makes a lot of sense from a Turkish perspective uh, uh, and the GNA was, was almost ready to go either way, either to the east or the south. Uh, so there was clearly a priority because uh, CERT is closer, it was more natural and didn't work out. Uh, now CERT seems to be difficult, so we, we might see all kinds of reasons to refocus on the Fazan, because after all, there's a lot of uh, potential in terms of control over, over income and, and reviving the oil, uh, the oil uh, ex extraction out of the Fazan and, and Alfield. So, uh, so the, to me, the, the picture is quite grim, and I hope I will have given you at least um, uh, a desire to, or any, a curiosity to look more into this region. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Jalal. Uh, maybe something that we can pick up on. So we'll have an hour uh, right after 
normally Hanan's intervention, but maybe something we can pick up on afterwards is not only is there sometimes an interest from the parties as part of the war, but sometimes there's also an interest from the Fazazna themselves to secede, which is something that we've seen now in the past couple of days. I think there's this movement in the South that supposedly, supposedly amalgamates different uh, components, whether they be Arab, uh, Tuareg, or Tabu. And uh, that has been, to a certain extent, based on preliminary info uh, repressed by Haftar. So clearly there's a narrative there to maybe unpack. Uh, but speaking of maybe uh, neglect and uh, abuses and whatnot, uh, perhaps the, the picture as we've all painted it is grim uh, to a certain extent, not least is the first of all the fallouts from the conflict which have been devastating from a human rights perspective we've had a lot of people displaced we've had a lot of people lose homes uh, we still potentially will have a wave of displacement from central libya and we as part every, everyone is kind of suspecting that the two coalitions that we have now will fragment uh, inevitably at a certain point which will be which will lead to more conflict uh, that that is obviously aside the effects of the pandemic that are currently unfolding in Libya. So with that kind of grim picture, uh, unfortunately, I'll ask uh, Hanan Salah to maybe paint paint a picture of what human rights, what what she's seen. She, I know you had several trips to Libya over the past, even during the war uh, last year. So maybe from your perspective, how how could we deal with the human rights abuses in Libya? Maybe as part of the Berlin conference or the Berlin kind of setup, I know that there's a human rights kind of component uh, there to a certain extent that is unfortunately compartmentalized from everything else. So maybe your recommendations on that would also be appreciated. Um, and yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave the room to you. Uh, thank you so much, Ahmad and everybody else. Um, I've been listening with a lot of interest to what you called the grim picture. I'm afraid uh, it's just going to get grimmer. Uh, so hold on tight to your napkins uh, as, I, as I speak. Um, the war has had a, a devastating toll uh, on civilians. Uh, working for Human Rights Watch means that we're not in the business of predicting what will happen next week or in a month. But the one thing that I can predict is that this conflict is not over. This conflict has just shifted uh, its center. It has shifted its center from Tripoli uh, to a little bit further uh, to the center of, of, of Libya, but it's not over yet. Uh, and I don't see uh, that any of the involved parties have any interest uh, or uh, that there is any uh, reason to think uh, that, you know, uh, they will downscale their presence and that they will downscale their support. So this is, I think, for the immediate and for the medium term, the one prediction I'm willing to make is that we are still in a state of conflict, even though the situation in Tripoli has relaxed a little bit for civilians. Now, many of the areas have obviously been, uh, areas in Tripoli have been affected. And I'm, what I will try to do uh, in the time that I'm allotted, I'm trying to give you a bit of an overview of what has happened so far uh, in this conflict, some of the more ongoing concerns that we have about the human rights situation uh, in Libya, and then some prospects for accountability, impunity. Uh, and I will try to tackle the um, possible political uh, angle that, that you spoke about, Ahmad, uh, uh, as well. Um, so many of the areas have been affected uh, for a year and a half now, or let's say a bit less than that, there's been uh, an ongoing conflict uh, in, in Tripoli and its surroundings that has currently shifted a bit more to the center of Libya, to the area of uh, Sirt. We have, uh, according to the UN, obviously there's been hundreds of thousands of people who were displaced just because of this conflict. Um, and uh, it, it amounts to a large percentage of the population, around 200,000 were displaced. Given the, the situation in some of these areas, um, I do not believe that they will be able to return uh, to their homes soon. Now, Ahmad, of course, spoke about a very important point that hasn't really come out yet, um, is that Libya is among one of the countries that is at high risk from the coronavirus. Uh, Libya has weak capacities to detect and respond to the coronavirus of this uh, the virus, this predated the conflict. And, and even if the conflict hadn't happened, uh, Libya would still be in a very bad position to respond to such uh, a pandemic. Um, the system, uh, um, you know, we are now seeing uh, 
some, in some areas uh, that the health sector is really struggling. Uh, the South is one of the areas um, that has been struggling, that has not been, uh, has not really been at, on the receiving end of any of uh, the support that is so centralized uh, in Tripoli and, and often in uh, uh, Benghazi. So um, the functioning health structures that you would need uh, to accommodate, obviously, plus access to water, access to uh, other, other services, uh, are simply not given. So obviously we have a huge concern that should this pandemic have a further outbreak uh, uh, that you know the country, the entire system uh, would uh, collapse. Um, the operation by the Libyan Arab Armed Forces, I'm going to be calling them Haftar Forces intermittently, National Army, whatever it is you want to call them. I think the important point is that this is an armed group uh, that is calling itself the Libyan Arab Armed Forces. Uh, it is supported, though, by the elected um, by the um, elected legislature of of, uh, of Libya, the legislative authority, which is the Libyan Parliament. Um, that does, still does not make it a state actor. So let's just agree that uh, it's it's an armed group, and I'll be calling it uh, different different things uh, during this brief uh, talk. Obviously, the um, uh, their their unhinged attack uh, on the capital and on the on on the um, uh, on, the, on, on the suburbs, together with the foreign affiliated uh, forces, and there's uh, many of them, um, including, um, as you well know, already have been mentioned, uh, Emirati uh, intervention, Egyptian intervention, um, Russian intervention, apparent private uh, military uh, company, uh, possible uh, use of mercenaries, definite use of foreign fighters, including from Syria and from other places, um, definite use of foreign fighters from, um, uh, from different African countries, including Chad and the Sudan, but also other African uh, nations that are not so often included in the toll on both sides, actually. Both parties are using uh, foreign fighters from different uh, places. We have documented um, widespread use of explosive weapons in populated areas. Uh, that is prohibited uh, by international law, uh, mostly through air and drone strikes, but also through artillery, uh, also from both sides. And I'll get to that uh, a little bit more. But we have also documented um, uh, the use of prohibited weapons by the Libyan Arab Armed Forces, uh, such as cluster bombs, uh, the laying of internationally prohibited landmines uh, in residential areas that are used by civilians. Um, that's just before the withdrawal of these forces of the uh, of the of the Haftar forces and their affiliated uh, foreign forces, um, but we have also documented um, enforced disappearances, extra extrajudicial uh, killings, and arbitrary um, uh, detention. Uh, there's also one thing I think that's very important to mention here is that there have been, there has been really since 2011 multiple waves of forced displacement across different parts of the country. So there's been forced displacement wherever there's a conflict there's been forced displacement uh, and currently under the current situation uh, there's around 400 to 500,000 people who are displaced uh, internally displaced in Libya and among them a good percentage are forcibly dis uh, forcibly displaced meaning they cannot really go back to their homes. Uh, those include many families from eastern Libya who are at odds with uh, Khalifa Haftar um, and his policies, uh, but there, there's also families um, from, from the West, uh, also families from Southern Libya who had, have moved now upwards after uh, the tension and after the continuous struggle um, that uh, Jalal talked about in uh, Southern uh, Libya. Um, I'm going to focus on the armed conflict, but I think it's important just to mention very briefly that there are ongoing violations uh, by groups that are linked or affiliated with uh, the, the government of national accord, but also the interim government in eastern Libya um, or the uh, Libyan Arab Armed Forces um, that are under the command of Khalifa Haftar that include uh, systematic and very widespread arbitrary detention, long-term arbitrary detention, meaning people are held uh, for a very long time without any kind of judicial uh, review. This has also been going on since 2011, and it has not stopped. So after every wave of conflict, uh, in, in any area, um, we, we see people held in long-term arbitrary detention, but we also see people held in such conditions for ordinary crimes. Um, and there is also, of course, a large number of migrants, as you know, uh, that are currently in Libya. Um, the smallest number of them is actually held in detention. So the, the smallest number of people actually end up in a prison in, in Western Libya, mostly uh, under inhumane conditions. 
uh, by forces that are affiliated with the government of national uh, accord, some of them more directly linked uh, than, uh, than uh, others. All of these are human rights violations. In some cases, they amount to uh, war crimes, depending on where, uh, where we are. I think the one important thing uh, that I should mention up front is uh, some of the challenges that we have faced is the complete lack of presence of international, um, of independent and international media um, in Libya has made it very, very difficult uh, for many of us to follow some of the events. It means that we are really relying on information that is coming from one source um, and mostly coming from the government of, of the national uh, accord, which makes it very, very difficult when you have one source and you have to verify with one source and find a way uh, to speak with people and try to establish uh, the facts. And one uh, example of that is uh, you have heard probably that there has been the discovery um, you know, with the withdrawal of the uh, Kani militias or the forces that were affiliated with Khalifa Haftar from uh, Terhuna uh, towards Eastern Libya, uh, there's been a number of unmarked uh, grave sites that have been uh, found and a number of dead bodies that were found in there. Um, and, you know, the, the, the single source that we have is the government of national accord. Uh, to be fair, they have been given, they have been giving frequent uh, updates, but we really need uh, an international or at least an independent body uh, to be looking at these crimes and to be uh, at these possible crimes and also uh, to be investigating properly. And I'll, I, this will be a bit more important to when I, when I speak a bit more clearly about you know, some mechanisms for uh, accountability. Um, given that you know, this is, uh, I hope some students are listening, um, the conflict in Libya is a non-international armed conflict that was internationalized with the participation of Turkey, the UAE, Egypt, and Russia, who are very overtly intervening. But then there's other uh, countries such as Jordan uh, and Qatar who are a bit more silent backers currently. It wasn't always the case, but currently. Um, and uh, the situation has been very tricky with regards to uh, foreign fighters and mercenary groups. Uh, we hear a lot about mercenaries being involved. Um, again, this is a non-international armed conflict. So classifying a group as a mercenary group is really sort of um, a difficult one. Uh, again, uh, for the students here, uh, any, any use of mercenaries is illegal under international law. Um, and that is, that is a very important point that um, I think needs to be reiterated because it doesn't seem to be clear uh, to the parties to the conflict that the use of a mercenary group is illegal. Uh, but there are obviously other foreign fighters that are affiliated with the groups. Um, um, I'm not gonna say that's fine. I'm just gonna say that that's not as such against international uh, humanitarian law. Um, and there's also the involvement, of course, of private military uh, companies that can, can be a mercenary group as well. Um, the, in, with regards to some of the trends that we have documented over the past year and let's say four months uh, or five months of, of this conflict, is that the main killer of civilians have really been the airstrikes and the drone strikes by mostly uh, the Haftar forces or uh, foreign groups uh, affiliated or backing. Uh, the, um, uh, the Haftar forces. We have seen very large scale attacks that have resulted in um, dozens of killings that have resulted in the destruction of vital civilian um, uh, infrastructure, including schools, including uh, uh, health uh, facilities. Um, I think that, you know, it's fair to say that the, 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 the conflict as such has affected and to a certain extent paralyzed movement in uh, Western Libya, but it has definitely affected the civilian population in Tripoli and specifically in the southern suburbs uh, of Tripoli and some of the surrounding uh, areas that were really in, in a very, uh, very difficult situation for, um, uh, for quite a long time. Um, I think, you know, the one thing to add with regards to the conduct of, um, of uh, uh, hostilities is that we have, um, we have concerning evidence of what appears to be unlawful executions. Uh, of fighters affiliated with the government of national accord by the uh, Haftar uh, uh, forces. We have uh, already publicly spoken about uh, uh, this issue. Um, there's also evidence that seems to suggest that there's a really widespread and systematic laying of internationally prohibited landmines. Um, this is a very big issue and I'm repeating it uh, as, as a very major issue because it really prevents the civilian population from returning to these residential areas. We have also seen a number of deaths in relation uh, to these internationally prohibited landmines and booby traps, uh, over 150, it's probably more uh, by now, uh, people who have been uh, uh, killed either trying 
um, to disarm these uh, these uh, weapons or you know just by accident, just you know civilians returning uh, to their to their homes. Uh, Libya was uh, a country that was very heavily contaminated and the situation was a little bit better under control after 2011. And I think the concern that we and other uh, groups have that work more closely, obviously, with landmines is that this recontamination uh, is, not a, is not a simple thing. It's not a matter of, um, I don't know if any of you have been to a field like that, but it's not a matter of just, you know, going there and, you know, moving with a stick and then it beeps and then you remove it. It really takes months and I'm, I'm concerned that some areas uh, in Tripoli will take years uh, really to clear of all these mines. So this means that there will be really a need for alternative housing for all of these people who are not able to return um, and you know there needs to be a whole system in place to accommodate that and we are talking about a few hundred thousand people. We're not talking about you know a small number of people who can be accommodated uh, in one place, and we have already seen that the government of national accord is really helpless um, and has not prioritized uh, the well-being of civilians. Um, even when I was in, in Tripoli um, some months ago, um, definitely uh, those internally displaced uh, people were not being taken care of uh, by the government in sufficient ways. I think that there's a lot that the government of national accord can do uh, to to uh, you know about about their uh, situation. Um, the other challenge with regards to some of these attacks is that uh, there's often no party that takes responsibility, or there's hardly ever a party that takes responsibility for these attacks. Um, sometimes the situation uh, is easy because sometimes, I mean, easy in a sense that you're able to go on the ground, you're able to document remnants, for example, um, of a drone, um, and then you know, you're able to attribute it very, very easily to one, one party to the conflict. But when it comes to this cross shelling in civilian areas, which I've documented more than I than I would ever want to, uh, but you know, there it's very very difficult often to attribute responsibility to either party to the conflict. They're all using the same kind of enormous number of heavy weapons um, uh, that you know is usually fired through uh, artillery or uh, other ways. I'm, I'm not a weapons expert, but. I know the weapons that are used in Libya, but you know, just to say that there's an enormous number uh, that is being used, uh, different types that are being used. Uh, we have seen the introduction of some new weapons uh, here, especially since uh, the uh, the these foreign uh, foreign forces uh, started to uh, or entered entered the stage. But by and large, it's the same kind of heavy weapons uh, that we have been uh, documenting, and that makes it very very difficult to attribute uh, uh, responsibility. To either part of the, uh, to either uh, party to the conflict. Um, I'm seeing that the time is running away, but maybe let me talk a little bit about um, the um, the so one issue of a bit of the GNA, the roles of the UN and the EU, and some prospects for accountability, and try to answer uh, some of the some of the some of the questions um, raised there. With regards to the government of national accord, um, I think that you know as I as I said earlier, uh, we have had better access to areas that were um, controlled by the government of national accord. Um, they have let in some reporters at the beginning, that's before the corona crisis and before, um, uh, you know, people were unable to travel to Libya, as is currently the case. Um, uh, but, you know, it has been much more difficult to access areas that were at the time under the control of the Libyan National Army. So I would say that we have, or the Libyan Arab Armed Forces, I would say that there is um, an enormous amount of uh, information that we that we simply don't have that you know that has not been shared with us because it's not there uh, because nobody can really uh, nobody really has uh, uh, um, statistics let's say of the number of killings on the on, on the side uh, uh, on the part uh, or in areas that were under the control of, of uh, Khalifa Haftar uh, that is coming a little bit to light as I mentioned with these uh, grave sites uh, that were found, these unmarked grave sites. Um, some of them date back to 2013 and 2014, but some of them appear to be very new. So um, some of them appear uh, to contain the mortal remains uh, of people. Uh, we don't know if they were fighters or if they were civilians. Um, that, that, that is very recent. Uh, there appears to be evidence uh, of, of crime. So there appears to be evidence uh, that some people uh, were, were executed um, and were, uh, were then buried in this unmarked site. Uh, but, you know, we don't have uh, sufficient information to say this about all the unmarked sites. I do have some statistics uh, about, um, uh, about seven locations so far in Tarhuna uh, that, have been, uh, that have been excavated with a total of about 46 uh, bodies 
each site containing about one to 11 bodies. But then there's many more, uh, about 17 locations, that were other locations in, in Tripoli. These are not that included 26 bodies in total. So this means that, you know, in, uh, some of these uh, grave sites had one to, to a maximum of four, uh, four bodies in them. Um, and a lot of work needs to be uh, done, uh, especially on, on this point. As I said, some of these grave sites date back to um, quite some years. Um, one more word to the government of National Accord. I think one issue that has been a concern to us throughout this uh, conflict and that we have mentioned to them on many uh, occasions uh, and that preceded this conflict actually, um, is that uh, there's a, still a, a large number of civilians uh, adjacent to military uh, facilities. And that of course heightens the risk of, of civilian harm. Now, Tripoli is not Gaza. So um, it's not the same situation. It's not the same excuse to say, well, where are we going to go? Uh, with, with, you know, where we're we going to go then as, as armed groups. So it's not, it's really not a good excuse and not sufficient to say these are, this is the location where we are and it happens to be among civilians. Um, and, you know, there you go, tough luck, deal with it. We have documented a number of cases uh, where there have been attacks that, you know, we say are unlawful attacks uh, by uh, the Haftar forces, but that nonetheless also carry responsibility by the government uh, of national uh, uh, accord to remove these armed groups that are affiliated with the government of national accord from compounds, for example, from prison compounds, um, such as migrant prison compounds. And there was one very, very disturbing incident, uh, a war crime really, where 53 people uh, were killed by what we believe uh, was an Emirati strike uh, at the time. So the government of national accord, uh, while they're also responsible for um, some of the uh, um, some of the violations. Um, the, uh, this, I think, has been a very major uh, uh, concern and they carry an equal uh, responsibility as the belligerent uh, uh, party. Uh, very briefly on the role of the UN and the EU, because that has been, especially the role of the EU, um, that has been mentioned by some of the speakers, especially by, by Peter. Um, I would say that, you know, with regards to the, to the, to the, to the, to the European Union, um, the entire uh, EU approach uh, in Libya and policy in Libya. Um, when you, Peter, you said that we have stopped speaking with a unified uh, voice and you included everybody in that. Um, you know, I would say that maybe I would rephrase it and say from my point of view, the way that we saw it is that it really became a policy of appeasement at some point. Uh, Tarek very eloquently said uh, uh, there was a sense that Haftar needed to be uh, accommodated. And I believe that we, again, we saw it a little bit more um, from the point of view um, okay, you know, there needed to be the appeasement of certain parties to move forward with a very limited framework that the UN had set. The UN that really came in with this dual role of being a political mission and at the same time having a human rights and rule of law um, mission. And that really put the EU countries in a very difficult position to then come and say, we're going to enforce uh, the arms embargo. Um, the last thing I think uh, which is important to, to mention is how to move forward, how to move, for, uh, how to move away from this very limited political process, how to move forward with uh, Berlin. Um, I believe the game really needs to change. Uh, it really needs to change in a sense that so far um, this policy of appeasement, uh, as I'm calling it, has not really uh, worked. There is a sanctions regime in place, uh, the Security Council uh, countries are now, some Security Council countries are now involved in the Libyan conflict. This makes it very, very difficult to sanction anyone when Russia itself is involved. How are they ever going to agree uh, to sanction anyone? So that really makes it uh, a, a no-go. Uh, there is an arms, em arms embargo in place that has not been used. Uh, so there is a very diligent and very meticulous, um, uh, you know, investigation going on all the time by the uh, panel of experts uh, that you know yields great reports but that names even uh, countries who are violating uh, the arms uh, embargo uh, quite systematically since many years but we have not seen that anyone has been uh, sanctioned so this seems to me again that the um, that you know the EU is using this Irimi uh, uh, operation really as an as an excuse or as a, as a fig leaf even to cover up uh, for their inability and their unwillingness to enforce it for all parties to the conflict. If you're willing to enforce it for Turkey, why aren't you willing to enforce it for the UAE, Jordan, and all the other countries that are supplying weapons and have been supplying weapons for so many uh, years? And again, I, I just want to also be clear that no backdoor agreements between Turkey and Russia or any other uh, of, the, uh, of the parties absolve individuals or commanders of personal criminal reliability in this 
uh, conflict. So this needs to be, um, I think, clear because you know it seems that the um, some of the international players are either un unaware or don't care that they could be complicit uh, in very serious human rights uh, uh, abuses. The domestic justice system in Libya has collapsed. The international criminal court has collapsed at the national level. Uh, the court system is a very fragmented um, and really dysfunctional one if it operates at all. The International Criminal Court has been very slow uh, to start to conduct investigations um, and has not really had the, the desired effect uh, of slowing down the pace uh, of these uh, war crimes or acting as a deterrent, really. Um, there is a, a new fact-finding mission um, that was newly established by the Human Rights Council um, and that, you know, uh, we have, I guess, modest expectations, uh, but it is at least one thing where we say, fine, at least now we have a body that is responsible to um, investigate. I'll end it with that. Uh, I think that was exactly 15 minutes. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take your questions. So it was a bit more, but uh, it's okay. I think it is, oh, it, this is quite important to make these points to a certain extent. Uh, I'll abuse my power as moderator because I've got, uh, I received several questions. I posed some of them already to you. So do take those into account in your uh, responses, but I'll direct actually specific questions directly to the speaker so as to benefit so as to benefit from the time we have left, which is exactly 40 minutes. Uh, so one of the questions we often get to a certain extent, uh, both as Libyans and as uh, analysts or people that are, are researching or covering Libya is whether there is nostalgia for the Gaddafi era in Libya and uh, or the future of Gaddafi loyalism. I'll pose this question exactly to, to Jalal, actually, specifically since the part of the Libyan Arab Armed Forces, or to a certain extent, the groups that aligned uh, with the Libyan Arab Armed Forces post Fazan operation were, to a certain extent, Gaddafi loyalists. I'm thinking Mohammed bin Nayel, uh, other, other groups as such that are, to a certain extent, green. And there is, at the moment, a momentum towards making the LAAF greener uh, as such. So perhaps speak to that, but do try and keep your answers to maybe less than three minutes so as to, uh, we have a lot of questions coming along. Yeah? Sure. Um, well, thank you very much for that question because I think it's a, it's a very important one. Um, I remember just before the, the big offensive in April 2019, I was speaking to some uh, people living in Tripoli, whether it was towards the east or the, you know, a little bit to the south near Sharif, they would speak about, you know, Gaddafi groups or Gaddafi militias. And it, I was so conditioned by the uh, usual trope or the usual format that said, you know, Siraj on the one side and Haftar on the other. I, I just couldn't process that information. In fact, uh, those groups were absolutely instrumental. And, uh, and Haftar has been working on had been working on trying to enroll them and approach them and, and flatter them and, and convince them somehow to join whatever military project he had in mind. And this is from a socio-political perspective, probably the, the, the most important event that, uh, that has taken place over the last two, three years. And it has been a very slow, painstaking effort on the part of, of Haftar. I think he was probably too slow. He started it too late and he wasn't quick enough. And, and, but, but there were a lot of um, uh, financial efforts that came with it. So I think from, from, the, from the perspective of a typical Libyan obser uh, Libya observer, uh, I think we are more or less all uh, responsible or, or guilty of having neglected this uh, ability of the ideology. Uh, I would call it an ideology more than as nostalgia, because once you, you recognize it as an ideology, you, you, you realize that it, it comes with a certain amount of political and military mobilization. It, it's really a force to reckon with. And, uh, and I think uh, research in general has neglected uh, greenism or Qaddafism, or I would say Qaddafisms in plural. And you have like all streams of convictions and beliefs with all the internal uh, contradiction and revelries and even bitterness uh, within, within that group of, of, of currents. So I think there's a whole uh, science and method to the madness here that should be deployed by research. And, uh, and, and I would say the same thing about diplomacy. 
I think diplomacy has neglected them. I think they could act as a king. I mean, one mental exercise is why is Russia so interested in pursuing these people? And it's not just because you have a, a genuine belief or, or sympathy for the actual ideology. It's simply because it's the closest thing to a, um, a, a, a convincing set of technocrats with a certain amount of experience. You know, yeah, between 42 years versus a few years of chaos, who, you know, according to the Russians, has gotten more uh, experience in terms of running whatever used to act as the state. Uh, and also the other reason for the Russian interest, uh, which is also echoed by uh, a similar attitude on the part of the Egyptians, especially now, post-collapse in, in Tripolitania on the part of Haftar, you have uh, the ability to use the third leg or as, as a kingmaker. So, uh, you know, I think we should all study this. I think it's, uh, it's a, an actual belief with, uh, with all the commitment that, that comes with it. And uh, I think we're going to see much more of it. We're going to see much more of it in, in the East, I think. Uh, and in, and in, even in Tripolitania, after the defeat, I think there's going to be a revival with a huge time lag, probably. But right now, the immediacy or the, the immediate prospect is to see more of it in the East. I think it's quite helpful to, to actually speak to it as an ideology because some of the armed groups that are get deaf, so to speak, are quite cohesive in that sense and mobilized on that basis, actually. So it, it wasn't like he was recruiting individuals. He was recruiting actually entire, to a certain extent, constituencies, so to speak. Uh, I'll come to you, Tariq, and uh, I have two questions that maybe you can speak to. Um, so one of which is maybe unpack why the UAE is actually intervening in Libya. What are the actual interests or what, what, what does it want, so to speak? Because to some that might be puzzling, uh, understandably so. And then the other facet is uh, from an Arab League African Union perspective, what do you see their role as being? Is it nefarious? Is it good? Could they potentially play a positive role or uh, will we see the same kind of same old, same old? Um, thank you, Ahmed. Um, you know, from the, the UAE perspective, you know, the good kind of policy analyst response to, to this question is to point at um, kind of political and economic interests that the UAE would hold uh, in Libya. Um, you know, namely the UAE as its only successful oil diversification program uh, has been focused on kind of dominating shipping lanes, uh, trying to, to almost construct a, a miniature version of the Belt and Road Initiative um, between the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. Libya plays a crucial role there, and there's plenty of anecdotal evidence to suggest that, you know, through the Haftar vehicle, they wanted to take control of, of these Libyan assets. Um, from a political uh, point of view, it was this notion of, of trying to beat back the Arab Spring, um, and then I think if we step back and, you know, recognize that um, actors in, in reality and in this global game don't actually have perfect strategy and there aren't always kind of realpolitik um, urges driving them, we see the kind of blending of this um, political interest with, with ideology and really, um, you know, um, fear almost uh, that's driving this Emirati pushback uh, in Libya. You know, Libya as a state, especially as a revolutionary state, must have seemed very or far too fam familiar to be comfortable to the UAE. You know, small population, uh, big oil wealth, uh, and people starting to ask questions about uh, how, why did these people spend the nation's oil wealth in this manner? Um, and this is something that Abu Dhabi did not want to come closer to home. Uh, and so in, to that extent, Libya is something that has to be made an example out of. It is the kind of the rentier state to hold up and to show that you cannot have a revolution in the Arab world without it ending up in either chaos uh, or dictatorship. So best to stick with, with this kind of model. And I think that's what really drives the absolutism of the Emirati perspective, because we see every other actor, you know, Turkey, Russia, Egypt, ultimately they're looking for a deal. They're looking for some way to secure real tangible interests. But the Emiratis seem absolutely maximalist at all times. Um, and the only thing that can really explain such a zero-sum mindset is ideology, uh, or at least from, from where, where I'm sitting. Um, on the question on, on kind of the Arab League and the African Union, it's always tempting to try to lean on 
uh, kind of multilateral regional bodies. Um, but I think we've we've all known for, or we can all see for a while, that the Arab League is is not the most active body um, or the most effective um, regional political body. Um, the African Union, on the other hand, does have more more potential, I think, to get involved. Um, I think the problem is, is that similar to some other states um, like Russia and Egypt, uh, the African Union's best ties to Libya are, are through Gaddafists. Um, and it, in fact, Gaddafists have often tried to leverage, you know, key states within the African Union, uh, such as Ethiopia, such as South Africa, to come down on a particular side. Uh, and Egypt, especially during their year as chairman of the African Union, tried to use the body to, to counterbalance the UN and what they're doing. Um, so really, as, as long as the African Union tries to displace the UN, I don't think they will ever be successful or, 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 or have a role. Um, but if the African Union starts playing to its strengths, um, starts trying to, to share valuable lessons it has in issues like transitional justice and national reconciliation and so on, then I think it could actually be the, 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 the diplomatic force that uh, Libya needs right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Something to ponder about maybe as we uh, design a peace process if that is to happen at some point. Um, Peter, I'll come to you with another question that we have. So uh, uh, obviously try and link it to the question that I had earlier about some kind of security sector reform and this Turkish, uh, Turkish perhaps led approach to it. But uh, one of the questions that we had is this idea that Tariq spoke of a zero sum game of interest. So we've seen that kind of crystallize in the US holding back from actually intervening or doing, doing anything substantial on the ground aside perhaps uh, as some speculate some uh, green light to Turkey uh, primarily to actually counter Russia. But aside that, it's not really doing much but issuing statements and honestly being a narrator to the conflict. Uh, what might this mean for the future of the region, first of all, but also uh, to a certain extent, Libya specifically and its security sector? Because previously, most of the kind of efforts that we had from a security sector reform perspective were US brokered or uh, at some point UK brokered as well uh, for, for training purposes. But uh, other than that, we didn't really have an effort for formal security sector reform uh, on that front. And if you want to consider the LAAF or the Libyan Arab Armed Forces as a security sector reform effort, it was primarily a covert one and perhaps a failed one at that, as we might have seen over the past year or the past few years. So maybe you can speak to those dynamics in less than three minutes. Okay, there's an awful lot to cover there, Ahmed, but yeah. I think security sector reform uh, has been on the agenda for, for quite a long time. Um, everybody will, well, people I hope will remember the disastrous general purpose force, the training of 350 Libyans in Cambridge or in Bassingbord in England, which just turned it into a disaster because it was a, it was a source of nepotism as to who was chosen to go. They weren't really military. They had no cohesion at all. But clearly, security sector reform and DDR will have to be part of any process in the future. Um, to try and bring the forces all together into a single hierarchy is going to be an extremely difficult endeavor. I absolutely agree with what Hanan has said about the Libya Arab Armed Forces being a non-state actor, because they too are just another group uh, of militias. Um, you mentioned earlier, Imad, the, 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 the slogan of money, uh, militias and Muslim Brotherhood. But clearly the the money and militias are linked because many of those militias, particularly in Tripoli, are in it for the money. Uh, the statistics on the numbers of young men who joined militias when they were offered a salary and the status of a gun, but it was the salary that they were after. And then the number of people who joined militias exploded exponentially. So quite how you link security sector reform, DDR, and how you wean all those young men off the easy drug of a salary is going to be a major challenge. But I don't think, I think one of the mistakes of Schaerat was that it was only political. It didn't really cover security sector reform in any way at all. And therefore the majority of stakeholders were not prepared to, to buy into it. So what the UN had been trying to achieve at Gadames was to link politics and security 
security sector reform and so forth, it will have to be a fundamental part of whatever process uh, is launched in the future. We'll have to get the buy-in of the stakeholders and that will have to involve both um, demobilization and finding new jobs and new salaries for those people to get them out of the militias. Okay, that's, uh, that's actually a really interesting point with regards to uh, Radames to a certain extent, because what we've seen with Radames is that there was a design to a certain extent of a locally bottom-up type, uh, type of deal uh, mm -hmm. that would actually embed all, the, all these uh, points or try and actually broker a deal that would to a certain extent bring all these together. Uh, all of you, to a certain extent, uh, especially Hanan spoke of a, a temptation to accommodate Haftar uh, over the past few years. I'm seeing personally a shift right now from accommodating Haftar to accommodating the Libyan Arab Armed Forces as such purely to uh, preserve that entity. Whether that's a good policy choice or not is debatable considering the flaws of the entities and its uh, its relationship perhaps to local communities and how cohesive that uh, that entity will uh, remain or will turn uh, without Haftar at its head. But uh, I'll come to you, Hanan, and maybe you can speak to this dynamic. So how to avoid kind of pre-cooking a deal that rewards uh, spoilers. Perhaps Haftar won't be accommodated uh, and perhaps he's now bitten, bitten too much uh, and he, he will be discarded. But uh, how can we kind of, to a certain extent, get to a political settlement with accountability while, uh, while this kind of impulse to accommodate the LAAF as such uh, exists? Because to a certain extent, the fact that uh, everyone, there was has been an issue, a flurry of statements with regards to de-escalation around SIP is symptomatic of uh, an impulse towards preserving the LAF because a lot of people figured that if SIRT is lost, then that will automatically have a knock-on effect on the East, but also the South. So it's a contagion of instability everywhere. But how, how do we marry that kind of with a transition uh, that would kind of preserve a, that would kind of accommodate both foreign interests, but also local ones and preserve accountability. In three minutes. So um, <laughs> the, I would say that to unpack that a little, um, yeah. I'm at, um, one, I think it's a little uh, premature because the, um, I mean, for now, we still have the ongoing armed conflict and there's still, no ceasefire that I know of, um, and I haven't seen any ceasefire hold for more than a week, if, if at all, uh, in Libya. Um, so I think that, that that's still a dynamic that definitely needs to be dealt with, that there's an ongoing armed conflict and that everybody is shipping in weapons like crazy. Um, you know, everybody is escalating at this point. Nobody is de-escalating. And I think that if you're going to look at, obviously, you know, we all want to talk about this other uh, part of it and hopefully a Berlin 2 and a Berlin 3 and then we have this great conference and everybody's happy and yay we have elections again um, and then you know that that's it but I think that you know we we you know if we are to be uh, a bit more realistic about where, where Libya is at first uh, there really has to be a move away uh, from this idea uh, that you know the uh, the foreign backers or the enablers uh, of, of this uh, of, of this conflict um, I mean, they're obviously the ones calling the shots and you have uh, the Libyan actors currently, you know, uh, playing along and doing what they need to do to stay uh, afloat. Um, but I think there needs to be a shift away that, you know, you can go and sit in Berlin again with the same people uh, and you will have some people who will agree and commit and they will in fact be, you know, not telling the truth. And it's as simple as that, call me naive, but you know, there were people who are just you know, lying through their teeth and that is a problem. You cannot move away into a situation uh, where, where you have that. Um, and the, the situation I think is a bit compounded by the fact that a Security Council member with a veto right is involved in this conflict. Um, and that Security Council member is, is a you know, strong one um, and is able to get China to agree and is able to get other countries to sort of back down. Uh, so that makes any of the traditional ways to deal with rogue, rogue actors, be it warlords, be it you know, very abusive commanders or even civilian officials uh, that, are, that are very abusive. That makes it very, very difficult. 
Um, so I think, you know, the first step uh, would be to, um, I guess, um, have an agreement, uh, especially with the European Union countries. Um, and Peter Veli very, uh, you know, eloquently spoke about France's role. Uh, France, you know, almost destroyed uh, the processes in Libya and had a very damaging role, was one of the main spoilers. But if you're able to get the European countries, uh, you know, to, to, to have a consensus at least that there needs to be a form of accountability. And this form of accountability has to start somewhere and it has to be with local actors. And if Haftar fell from grace for whichever reason, he fell from grace, you know, the first, he should have fallen from grace the first time he ordered his uh, uh, forces to, 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 you know, recklessly kill civilians. But, you know, since it took so many years and this current conflict, I would say that, you know, it's not just Haftar, but people like him uh, should very much be held up to an international standard of law and order, uh, which is currently not, not the case. Um, and it's unfair to name only one person from one side, uh, but you know, I'll leave it at that for now, I guess. Okay, uh, only named Haftar because there's a kind of a now, now a shift away from him, both amongst his foreign backers and also amongst, for example, the US. There was an article yesterday that mentions envisioning sanctions on him, et cetera. So one could wonder what the political process could look like, but also the security landscape could look like if he's has I'm that not, big if trade. I if I may, the United States could have done something about this issue a long time ago. They could have yeah, had a policy for Libya, which they haven't, and they could have had, uh, you know, a very uh, concrete policy. They're quite good at that if they want to. Uh, their Africa command has been intervening in Libya nonstop, and they have been conducting multiple airstrikes uh, in southern Libya, um, you know, at times more intense than at other times. Uh, but, you know, nothing has held them back from their fight against terror. So they're capable of doing, I think, um, uh, a lot more. So obviously, um, I, you know, I think that, you know, there needs to be a consensus with the Americans as well, but, you know, the Americans are not in a great position right now either uh, because they're panicking about Russia's role. And panic, you know, and the United States is with the current president, forgive me, is not really a good combination. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Hannah, great, great points. Um, uh, Jalal, I'll come to you back again. Uh, we, I spoke to you earlier quickly, quite quickly, about this kind of secessionist movement to a certain extent. But uh, one of the questions that we had that is maybe linked to this uh, is the risk that either side will fracture and turn this into a kind of three or four party conflict rather than just one. So what, from a scenario perspective, obviously this is difficult to kind of look into a crystal ball and figure that out, but how, realistic uh, is that prospect from your perspective? Well, I think it's completely under understandable, uh, the fact that you have this all uh, kind of away from the big other two that are going to keep fighting amongst each other. Uh, so you could you could see if you accept this this uh, idea of a, of a neutral fazan, which uh, which is incorrect. Uh, I would tend to say that uh, yeah, from there you could uh, you could start dreaming almost by saying, we, you know, we have the oil. If we could simply uh, but, uh, and there's probably this idea of a demilitarized zone around CERT. If we could use that to establish a corridor that gives us access to the sea, and then uh, we could keep uh, part of our uh, oil revenue and so on and so forth. But to me, that's just wishful thinking because uh, number one, the Fazan was not neutral. That's not true. I mean, obviously, we remember just the last six to nine months, but I would tend to, to uh, kind of. Uh, um, uh, tend to uh, underscore that uh, in April, you know, you had Tuareg going into um, going into Arian, going into Tarhuna. You had like, of course, uh, the, the Magarha of uh, the Nile, who who we mentioned, who died recently. Uh, that was, uh, I mean, that that group was actually military participating uh, from Arian when when people st still thought that it was going to be a brief war. Um, and I would tend to just say one thing is that there's one uh, conundrum in uh, Libya related diplomacy is that the people who speak about drawing borders um, uh, between the provinces and, and federation and separationism and all these things, they never talk about how to split the oil revenue. They like to complain, but they never stick numerical figures of what they think is appropriate versus what the existing distribution. So of course the central bank 
cultivates opacity and it's uh, it's responsible, Tripoli is responsible for part of it, but also the people complaining uh, are complacent when uh, when the conversation remains abstract. And I think there's a, a threshold to a kind of cross right now from a diplomatic perspective where we, we say, okay, well, why don't we talk about, you know, separate budgets or, or like just break the taboo of actually going all numerical about how the oil... Uh, revenues should be split based on demog uh, demography or other criteria. And I think it's not going to make the, the possible uh, risks more vivid. It's, not, it's already a bad situation, so it's better to go explicit and talk about uh, sharing of, of uh, all revenues rather than dreaming, like I said. Okay, per perfect. Th thanks a lot. This, this somewhat uh, links to another question that I'll pose to Peter. So the idea of oil distribution, etc., is intimately linked right now, at least, with the oil blockade uh, that we've had since early this year. The U.S. before uh, before all these any instance where we had some disruption in the oil crescent was quite actively involved. This time we have somewhat of a perfect storm with the election coming up, uh, with the U.S. being disinterested, with the tendency to accommodate uh, Haftar or the Libyan Arab Armed Forces, so to speak, with the tendency to accommodate the Emiratis and this narrative of the tribes that want resources and also the, the audit. And last but not least, coronavirus that has exacerbated the price, the, the kind of crash of prices uh, oil-wise. That may, to a certain extent, explain why there's been a, a complacency towards the blockade, but what, what explains actually the fact that there has been no effort made whatsoever towards brokering an actual deal on that front or more coercion may be placed on the LAF to lift that? Yeah, I, uh, clearly the world doesn't need and the Americans don't need that extra 1.2 million barrels a day at the moment. But from my understanding, there was uh, a lot of effort uh, launched by Mustafa Senala, the, the chairman of the NOC, to lift the oil blockade by having this initiative that the oil revenues, instead of going uh, in the normal way to the central bank, would go to an NOC held account. And then there would be some formula for the fair distribution of that wealth. And I think that, that ultimately is, is the difficulty, is how do you define fair distribution among the three different regions of, of the country? Uh, because clearly, as uh, Jalal has said, the oil resources are mainly in the south. Uh, the pipelines go through both the, the east and the west. We know that the, most of the population is in the west, rather than the east and the south. So, on what basis do you, uh, do you uh, calculate what a fair distribution is? But I think a deal had been done and reached, uh, and from what I've seen from Mustafa Sanala, he blames the Emiratis very explicitly uh, for uh, the failure of that initiative. And at the moment, I don't see a lot of renewed pressure to uh, turn that into a reality. But clearly, uh, Libya is dependent um, on that oil, uh, the GNA's budget is dependent on the resources at the CBL. Uh, nobody really knows, uh, Sadiq Kabir never says how many, how, what's left in terms of those re reserves, um, but uh, I, I'm sure they're being rapidly depleted. Because one of the things we haven't really mentioned in, in terms of the, the money M is the fact that the vast majority of budgets uh, are de dedicated to salaries and subsidies, which is basically wasted money. Very little is invested in the uh, through capital expenditure into the fabric and the infrastructure of the country. All of that, going back to the point I made earlier about okay. linking the politics with the security with the economy, then economic reform has to be part of any future process as well. Okay, that's a good segue into the next question that I'll actually pose to Tarek. So, from a political perspective, there's clearly no avenue forward. From a security perspective, there's this SSR effort uh, in Western Libya that seems to be spearheaded by the Turks with certain GNA figures. Uh, from an economic perspective, it seems that the maximalist kind of approach of the UAE led to this kind of new uh, new model of revenue, uh, revenue distribution to not really materialize. Uh, 
that ultimately means that there has to either be, there will be either a frozen conflict or the prospect of a counter, of an offensive by the GNA or a counter offensive by the LAF. So how likely is that? And a question that is intimately linked to that is, if Egypt intervenes, what that would look like? Um, all right, to try to unpack the, the various questions in there. Yeah. I think it's, it's almost inevitable that we do head towards a frozen conflict in the short term, but that doesn't mean that a hot conflict over Sirte is not gonna happen. I mean, there is a lot of diplomatic pressure right now. I mean, it was focused on Turkey uh, to stand down, but it's also starting to trickle down to, to the Libyan entities involved uh, to avert a war for Sir today. But, and you know, on top of that is, is also the Russian presence, um, which, is in, which Turkey and the GNA have to acknowledge if nothing else, is going to make any fight for Sirte extremely costly and extremely bloody and messy. Um, and so all of these are incentives to stand down and to freeze the conflict, uh, as we call it. But none of the diplomatic efforts at play um, and none of the kind of uh, in, in internal discussions do anything to satisfy um, the underlying goals of, of either the intervening states um, or of um, this new Haftar replacement entity they've created around Aguila Saleh in the East, which is to grow to be a government in its own right and to displace the GNA. Um, so if none, of these, if none of these diplomatic solutions can satisfy the external backers or the internal players, then you inevitably end up back in a state of war. Um, and unfortunately, I think this is why war is inevitable. With the Egyptians, I think we've also ended up in a place now where, where Egypt has, has almost snookered itself um, because it, it talked up and it gave all of this rhetoric uh, about protecting its interests, about a military intervention. And, you know, I think it can be comfortable that with the diplomatic backing it receives from, from France and, uh, and the UAE, that the, the flaws in international law upon a formal intervention based on an, an official invitation by just the Speaker of the House, because they, you know, he can't get enough of a quorum uh, for even the Parliament to invite him officially, is going to be brushed over. They've jumped through all the loops and all the formalities of trying to mimic Turkey's intervention with you know, the parliamentary approval. There are uh, reports of, of troop buildups on the Western border, but it seems that this is a political decision and a product of a lot of political pressure uh, from abroad on on Sisi. And you can see that from the kind of talk that's come out of Abu Dhabi uh, to, you know, relight or rekindle Arab nationalism and talk about, uh, you know, this Arab sovereignty and push back against neo-Ottomanism. Uh, but the generals in Cairo, I think, are deeply disturbed right now. Uh, and they're unhappy that they're kind of being pushed into what looks like an intervention with no clear scope. Um, with all due respect to, you know, the military machine that, that they have in Egypt, I think the generals are happier being businessmen um, than generals these days. Uh, and this intervention in Libya is going to seriously disturb that. Um, and so when I, I think if we look at the public pronouncements around the intervention to date, the intervention will happen. Um, I think it will only be kind of a formal intervention within the bounds of Eastern Libya, rather than all the way up to Sirt. And it will kind of take the form of, of almost SSR for Eastern Libya's tribes. Um, that will create problems of its own. And the longer that the intervention goes on, the more it's going to spoil. It's going to be like bad milk out in the Libyan sun. Um, but it won't actually go to a formal frontal um, escalation with, with Turkey unless an offensive for Sirt starts then we'll likely see airstrikes, but we don't know where that escalation goes. And that's the dangerous part of the game. There is too much scope for unintended consequences to happen. That's an interesting analogy, even <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, I'll ask one last question that will be directed at uh, you, Hanan. We say that the Europeans, the Americans, etc., are not engaged. Um, and they are not, to be honest, but uh, one of the most heated discussions around Irene was actually it not saving lives, basically. It was designed not to save lives. So, uh, and we see that kind of embedded in every 
in every policy discussion around Libya, this question of uh, migration. Now we've had in the last two days boats that have a, a couple of boats, at least news that a couple of boats have been in distress and everyone knows they're in distress, but no one is willing to mobilize for search and rescue. Or everyone is not allowed, sorry, to mobilize for search and rescue by European states because they don't want to receive them. Uh, is there a potential for us relapsing back into a 2016-18 situation whereby deals are brokered to actually prohibit people from uh, from departing off of Libya? Or do you see that already happening in any way? Thank you for this uh, question. I was hoping to be able to speak a little bit more about the migration issue and the real uh, self inflicted European conundrum here, because I think that this is something that need not be where it is now. And, you know, the EU has really gone out of its way to fail itself when it comes to uh, this particular issue. Um, the, the, I think we're already there to answer your question very, very briefly. I think that the EU has been doing everything it can for the past two to three years at least to contain uh, my, migrants as much as, as it can in Libya and to really prevent them from leaving. And it started uh, by, you know, supporting um, these groups that call themselves uh, the Libyan Coast Guard. So we call them Coast Guard forces. There's different smaller Coast Guard entities on the Western Libyan coast. There is one bit more cohesive entity on the Eastern Libyan coast. It's a bit more Tobruk is on its own, obviously, and, you know, the rest of, of, Western, of Eastern Libya. But then you have these small entities starting from um, Misrata uh, to all the way down to Zawada um, that are really not cohesive and that don't have a clear chain of command. I've been trying to establish this chain of command uh, for many years uh, to try to prove to the EU that they're supporting armed groups and not, uh, you know, a, a state actor, uh, but, you know, to, to no avail. So that has been a really very problematic uh, uh, a very problematic policy of the European Union. Individual member states have made it even more problematic, particularly uh, Italy that has been giving direct support to uh, these you know, Libyan Coast Guard forces uh, in Western Libya, all of them in Western Libya, not in Eastern Libya, um, and France as well. They have also been uh, supporting uh, with uh, you know, hardware, with, uh, with boats, um, etc. cetera. Um, the policy has really been, um, especially uh, with the changing of colors of Operation Sofia, which did have as a mandate uh, a search and rescue, uh, which is really integral to every, uh, every maritime activity, uh, anybody who has maritime activity, who has borders uh, that have, uh, you know, that have a maritime border, um, have, are by law really bound to do a search and rescue. It's not really up to them to do it. They have to do it. Um, and there's been very disturbing uh, uh, policies in the past few years, uh, where, whereas the Italians um, and the EU have agreed somehow that Libya would deline delineate its own uh, international border and be doing search and rescue in these areas when they knew that Libya did not have the capacity to do it. So all of this to say is that the EU has really played a very big role um, in uh, you know, to put it politely in this, in, this, in this very, very big issue with uh, hundreds of thousands of people who are still in Libya, uh, thousands probably who would still go or try to, try to take a boat to go uh, to, uh, to, to Europe. And really what, what, what they really should be doing is to, again, convert this fig leaf operation, Irini, that they think we actually buy it, that that's, you know, to somehow enforce an arms embargo uh, when it's there to not to rescue people. It really goes against the humanity of everybody, uh, you know, in this great continent. And this is not something that should be allowed uh, uh, to go on, to contain the problem in Libya when, you know, Libya certainly can't deal uh, with this problem and is all too willing, you know, every authority that I've spoken with over the years uh, in Western Libya, be it the interim government or whichever interim government it was, has been all too willing to deal with, you know, the European Union uh, uh, on this very, very shameful um, uh, stance. So the, the, the only way forward here uh, really is to have a, a, a normal migration policy, meaning that, you know, don't use the corona crisis as an excuse. You have had thousands of people trying to reach Europe by boat before the corona crisis. You should have, you know, put some measures in place before that. Um, at least do your search and rescue the way that you're supposed to be doing your search and rescue. 
let those people who arrive in Europe, we're not saying take everybody who comes into Europe, but give them a fair chance, uh, a fair chance to apply for asylum. Um, and if you know you, if you prove that they're not worthy of your asylum uh, for whichever whichever reason, then you don't have to keep these people in the European Union. But whatever you're doing, whatever the EU is doing now, uh, is really adding to the conundrum and adding to the problem, and is really a, a, an inhumane um, face. Uh, that that really should not be there, uh, especially given Euro Europe the European Union and many of the countries' history uh, with the different world wars when they also were refugee-producing uh, country. It's incredibly shameful that this is where uh, it's ended. Thank, thank, thank you, Hanan. Uh, on that note, I'll thank you to my fellow panelists, speakers, and everyone. Um, I thank you for the Cambridge, Middle East, and North Africa Forum for hosting us. I'll wrap, I'll turn to actually MINAF's committee for, for a wrap up. And I'd like to thank you all for all those that also listened in. Thank you very much, Emaz. Uh, just very quickly, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of MENAF to all of our speakers for participating in this engaging and really comprehensive discussion on Libya. Uh, briefly, also apologies earlier for the brief uh, foreign intervention that we had uh, in keeping with the Libyan theme, perhaps. Um, and far, finally, just to turn our attention very quickly to Menaf's next upcoming event, which is the second in our two-part series on the annexation of the West Bank, which hopefully will be a great event again. Uh, we don't have the event yet confirmed, uh, the date confirmed for that, so just keep up with our social media and our emails for that. Uh, but once again, thank you very much, speakers and audience, uh, for attending today's event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.